my life and friends' lives just because they ask. We often think that, you know, I'm not going to bother God with this, whatever the, you fill in the blank, whatever this is. I'm not going to bother God with this. It's a menial thing. When Peter says, cast all your cares on Him for He cares for you, that care is limitless. It is from the largest thing in your life to the smallest thing in your life. He cares for you. That's the kind of father that we're related to. Say related. Related. That we're related to this morning. Now, I want to show you a connection, if I can, in the next few minutes. A connection that you may not have seen before between Jesus and the Father and the Father and Jesus. Remember what Jesus said, I believe it was to Andrew. When Andrew said to him, Jesus was about to go out of this world, enter the next dimension, and Andrew said to him, show us the Father. Now what Andrew was saying was, we understand, Jesus, that you're leaving this dimension of time and space. But show us the Father. What was he saying? He's saying, if you can convince us that the Father is really good, then you're going away will be okay. If we can really trust the Father, Jesus, then you're leaving this time and dimension space. It's going to be all right because the Father will be with us. And Jesus replies simply this, Philip or Andrew, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now I'm surprised at how many Christians miss this. Did Jesus go about condemning people? Did Jesus go about saying, uh, why don't you wait on your healing because you'll learn a lot through your, through your suffering? Did Jesus say that? Did Jesus say to Peter, look, I know you'd really like to walk on water, but we ain't got time for that. We've got to be about the Father's business. Is that what Jesus, Jesus said to Peter? No. So if you're seeing Jesus in all these pictures, remember I've talked very often about how the Bible is God's photo album of His favorite subject, and His favorite subject is His Son. As you look at Jesus, you see the Father. This is not just a metaphoric statement. Jesus said, I only say what I hear the Father saying, right? He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. You've got a good Heavenly Father. Look at the pictures of Jesus and see how God acts. Well, Carrie, I don't see that every day in my life. Really? I notice that here at the food bank, as we were down here yesterday, I'm, I'm always confounded by the unconditional love, which is kind of the mantra of the food bank. Isn't that right, Norman? That's right. The mantra of the food bank is God's expression of unconditional love. And I'm always amazed at how I see that love expressed through this food bank. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Do you know why, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but many of you were here yesterday serving people. Do you know why you do that? There are underlying reasons for, for people. But the primary reason that those who come who are consistent in giving the unconditional love of God is because they've seen the love of God. Amen. You cannot give what you have not experienced. Amen. Otherwise, what you're giving comes out like reading a book, a manual. Many, did you know many people see this as a manual? This is not a manual, man. This is a photo album. You want to see the Father? See Jesus. You want to see Jesus? See the Father. This is a photo album. You see, when we say this is our manual, what we're really saying is we're center. This is all about us. No, it's not all about us. 
It's about the Father. One of my favorite scriptures or stories that Jesus told is the story of what we call the prodigal son. Say it with me. Prodigal son. son. Wrong name. <coughs> The story is not about the prodigal son. The story is about the prodigal's father. You see what I'm saying? Even in Scripture, sometimes, sometimes get it wrong. Did you know that? That's just a subtitle. Jesus didn't say, now I'm going to tell you the story of the prodigal son. That's not what He said, okay? King James put that in there. The story of the prodigal son. No, 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 no. It's about the prodigal father. Because everything, I said this in our... Bible study on Thursday night. And by the way, you're, you're more than welcome to come. Just a few of us meeting, just chewing, meditating on the Word of God. And I hope that there being some lives are being transformed in that chewing, in that meditation, in that speaking to yourself. When Helen was talking about praying the Word, for example, you want to know how to have effective prayer? Pray the Word of God. Or carry on. The Word doesn't deal with what I'm dealing with right now. Is that right? Obviously, you've not read far enough. There's not an experience that you're having right now in your life that God has not already spoken to in His Word. That's what the word infinite means. He is an infinite God. And He's made provision for everything. Say everything. Everything that you're experiencing in your life, God has made provision for. The question is, you're going to ask for it. Are you going to ask for it? Are you going to believe what God says? Because see, there's a there's it's, it's an incredible war going on in this world that you may not be familiar with or may not be aware of. Have you ever noticed that even on newscasts, people will often use the word God? Because God can mean anything. The apostles did not say in the last days there will be this spirit of anti-God. He said in the last days there will be the spirit of anti-Christ. If you want to see the right God, you know how I know that other religions serve a different God? Because the only way you can see the God that we serve is through His Son. That is, that, that's not a... a a statement of elitism, it's a fact. Otherwise, Jesus is a liar. Because Jesus Himself said, I'm the door. I'm the way. And all of those I am statements in our Bible study, we're, we're uh, looking through the book of John presently. And John is filled, the Gospel of John is filled with these I am statements. When Jesus says, I am something... He's revealing to you, among other things, He's revealing to you what got Him killed. What got Him killed was not even suggesting a new world order as we often think. What got Him killed was claiming to be God. The word, the phrase, I am, is the name of God revealed to Moses at the burning bush. If you were Hebrew, you'd already know that. What made the Jews so mad when Pilate put Jesus on the cross and hung a sign over his head that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. When you look at that sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Do you know what it spells in Hebrew? The first letter of each line. Yahweh. God Himself. The Jews weren't just mad because Pilate had put a sign over Jesus' head that that stated that Jesus, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. That would have been okay. But the way he wrote it is to say this is the Jews' God hanging on the cross. You see, even in Jesus' death, He was showing the care, the love, 
the grace of God. And the sign over His head, this is going to be a revelation to some of you, the sign over His said, head said, hey folks, I am is doing this for you. Every time Jesus says I am, pay close attention because He's giving you another aspect of His personality. He's giving you another aspect of His love for you. I've said this before, I'll say it again, it bears repeat. If you question how much God loves you, then look at the price He paid for you. Jesus. Amen. But Carrie, you don't know what I've done. Isn't that a common response? You talk to somebody, and you say, you have no idea how much God loves you, do you? And they say, well, you don't know what I've done. My, my response has become, no, it's not that I don't know what you have done. You don't yet know what Jesus has done. If you're comparing what you have done to what God has done for you, you're using the wrong scales, man. Because there is no comparison. You can't get what God's done for you on the scales. I can get my miserable life on the scales, but I can't get what God has done for me on the scales. It's too incredible. It is too infinite. It is too broad. It is too deep. It is too wide. You can't. There are no scales to hold it, Jack. I'm just saying to you, this is the Father. This is the Father who reveals Himself this morning. And in the last five minutes, I actually do have a scripture. I'll give you. Jesus. Actually, I have a few. Romans 8, 34. Paul says, Who is he that condemns? Say condemn. Condemn. Is your conversation full of encouragement or condemnation? Just generally speaking. Think about it for a minute. Who is he who condemns? Do you know why as a child of God nobody can condemn you? Do you know why? Or did you even know that that was true? Nobody can condemn you as a child of God for only one reason. The person condemning you didn't die for you. Remember the adulteress? Everybody who couldn't cast the first stone wanted to throw the first stone. The one who could have cast the first stone would not. There's a picture of God. God has every right to burn us right off the face of the earth. But it's not in His nature. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ is not mad at you. I'm here to tell you this morning that God is not like some crotchety old man sitting on a throne waiting for the right moment so He can unleash the fury of His fire against sin on your life. Jesus, That is not the God who sits on the throne this morning. Look at the pictures of Jesus. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. Let me go on and read this verse. It is Christ that died. Remember I said others can't condemn you because they haven't died for you. That's why Paul says, it is Christ that died. If there's any condemning going on, He'll do it, and He refuses to do it. If there's any stone throwing going on, Jesus will do it, and He refuses to do it. You want to know how much God loves you and me? He says, rather... Christ, Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen. Why did He say that? Okay, Christ died for our sins, and usually that's our story of the Gospel. Jesus died for our sins. That's a good story, and it's right, but it's not the end of the story. Jesus died for your sins, but He was raised to prove that you have been justified. Put your hand on your heart and say, I have been justified. I have been justified. Say it again. I have been justified. Have you been justified? Jesus. Yes, Carrie, I have been justified. How do I know I've been justified? Because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Notice I didn't say that I know I've been justified because I behave right. I didn't say that I know that I've been justified because I do right. Well, Carrie, don't you believe in behaving right? Don't you believe in doing right? Absolutely. But if that right doing and that right behaving doesn't come from the inside, it's just behavioral modification. 
You see, when the Spirit of God comes in us, it produces right behavior. And do you know why? Or how? Because John says, those who believe. What you believe is important because what you believe will determine how you act. Did you know that? Well, Carrie, when I mess up, does that mean I didn't believe? No. It just means you're still under construction. Think about that. John didn't say if we believe, we'll always get it right. But John did say if we believe, we have eternal life. Say have. Have. He didn't say we get eternal life. He said we have it. There's a difference. How would you like if somebody came up to you with a million dollar check and said you get this? Or would you rather than put it in your hand and say you have this? Have you worked that out. Thank you. <laughs> this ain't brain science, is it? Jesus said if you believe, put your hand on your heart. Say to yourself, call your own name. Care. That's what I mean. What's your name? Care. If you believe. You have eternal life. Now let's do it again and say it like you mean it. See, your ears are hearing what you say. You want to know why you should not have a cynical spirit in this world? Is because your ear hears you say the sentences. And words are seed. You don't believe it, read it. What's the seed Jesus planted? On stony ground, on shallow ground, on good ground, among thorns, it was the Word. Words. Well, Carrie, that's just the Word of God. Is that right? Then why does the Scripture say that the power of death, say power of death. Power of death. And life. And life. Is in the power of death. The power of death and life is in the tongue. Some of us need to ask, and I'd be in that, I'd be in that group. Some of us need to ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse our tongue. You know, when your mama used to say, if you can't say nothing good, don't say nothing. Right. Did you know that was a biblical principle? A lot of religious folks, a lot of preachers need to hear that. If you can't say something good, don't say nothing. Because you've heard me say this before, but I wanted to get in your spirit. You don't need a preacher to tell you when you sin. Every one of you already know. That's why you're sitting there hoping nobody notices. Is that right? What you need is somebody to stand in front of you and say, if you sing the love of Jesus, when Peter said, Lord, I'd really like to come walking on these waves and wind. You know, those, those waves and wind, they could kill me. But you're walking on them. Why can't I walk on them? And Jesus didn't say, Peter, this is just for the Lord of glory. He didn't say, you can't do this because it's just for me. <coughs> Jesus said, come. Peter stepped out of the boat. And now Peter, looking at Jesus, is walking on the very things, watch this, walking on the very things that would destroy him. Anybody need to walk on some things that would destroy you? Look at Jesus. Who do you see when you look at Jesus? The Father. Who is He con who condemns? Nobody has a right to condemn you in anything except the one who refuses to condemn you in anything. Because there's only one who's died for you. And He says to you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. When we remove the power of condemnation from a person's life, they are empowered to go and sin no more. That's why I said what I said about you don't need folks to point out your sin. You already know it. What you need is somebody to say, neither do I condemn you. I take the power of the law off of your shoulders. Now go and sin no more. In other words, Jesus wasn't just saying, go out there and don't get trapped back in what you're in. That's part of what He's saying. But really what He's saying is go enjoy life. You can't enjoy life as an adulteress. You can't enjoy life with an appetite that will kill you. Jesus is saying, now go and enjoy life. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This, and if Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, who is Jesus mirroring? Your heavenly Father. 
All right. Jesus is at the right hand of God. Say the right hand. Right hand. The right hand is the hand of strength. God's not just favoring one hand over the other. It doesn't mean that if you're right-handed, you're more blessed than if you're left-handed. That's not what this means. There's a picture, however, in the Old Testament that the son who sits on the right hand, which is a model of strength, Benjamin, the son of Jacob. Benjamin means the son of my strength. The son of the right hand. Where is Jesus seated today? Which He wrought in Christ, this is Ephesians 1.20, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. <laughs> See, the right side in Scripture is very important. Where did Jesus tell the, the disciples to fish from? The right, throw your nets on the right side. The right side is the side of strength. It is the side of provision. Say provision. 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 See, I, I, I get you to say provision because you don't believe God wants to provide for you. God helps those who help themselves. That's why when Peter started to sink, that Jesus reached down and caught him by the hand and drew him up because God helps those who help themselves. I don't think so. Don't you reckon Peter was trying to help himself when he was drowning? And yet to no avail. But Jesus, mirroring the Father out of the goodness of His heart, reached down and drew Peter up above the things that would destroy him. That's the nature of your Heavenly Father. That's the nature of what I want you to see this morning regarding God. When you speak the name of Jesus, say Jesus. Jesus. If you say that name in faith, say in faith. In faith. Then you have just prayed. The Father has given Jesus a name above every name. Say every name. Every name. Did you know that Jesus is not wringing His hands this morning wondering how the election is going to turn out? Amen. <laughs> Did you know that most of the church seems to be closet atheists? We're good Christians till it becomes election year. And then doubt is all over us. That's called closet atheism. But Carrie, what will we do? Not much. But what will your Heavenly Father do? More than you can think, more than you can imagine. You see, God comes to live. What did Jesus do to Peter when he lifted him up above the waves? I was teaching on this that God lifts us up. When I was over in uh, Latvia, which is a Western Russia, Baltic state, and this song came to me while I was teaching on the fact that it's God who looked. What did the Good Shepherd do? He picked us. Uh, he put us on His shoulders. Shoulders is a picture of strength. And He carries us, berating us all the time. You know that you shouldn't have gotten lost. You know you shouldn't have been eating over there. You know that ain't what you're supposed to be doing. Is that how the Scripture says He carries us? It says He carries us rejoicing. He carries us rejoicing. That's the nature of your Father this morning. When God picks us up, He gives us opportunity to see, and that's what I'm saying to you this morning. When you begin to see God as Jesus sees Him, as Jesus revealed Him, your thinking rises above. Jesus is not worried about His future. Did you know that? Well, Carrie, that's easy for Jesus. He's Jesus, is that right? Then what does 1 John say? As He is, so are you in this world. Amen. Well, Carrie, I don't think that's right then stop thinking. And receive what the Word says. Because no matter how you believe, how passionately you believe what is wrong, it will still be wrong. Those people on 9-11 were passionate about their God. And they flew planes into a building and killed thousands of people. Passion does not make right. Amen. Our society seems to think so, but it doesn't. No, 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 no. Truth makes right. And the Scripture says that God lifts us up. So I was thinking about this. Some people hear this and say, Carrie, you can't do that. That's a secular song. 
They don't sell that in the Christian aisle at the bookstore. You know why you call it Christian music? So that the government can get the right taxes on the right music. All right. When did music get saved? Music never got saved. The same notes that Bach used is the same notes the Beatles used is the same notes that the writer of Amazing Grace used and the same notes that uh, Matt Redman uses. Okay? The message is the difference. But see how you can hear when God raises you up. The song says, I'm just going to do the chorus. behind the brambles of worry and anxiety. But when Jesus picks us up to see from His place, You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on Your shoulder. Raise me Heavenly Father. He raises you up to be more. Would you stand with me and sing it if you know? You raise me up so I Thank you. 